Okay, folks, we have made it finally to episode 7, which will cover the last chapter of 1776. Uh, so let's just jump right into it as we finish up the third part of the book uh, with chapter 7 entitled uh, The Darkest Hour. Uh, it has three parts to this chapter. Again, I would encourage you to check out uh, the maps on my PowerPoint as you go over this, as well as uh, the information I gave you in the last episode from Coach Dancy uh, called History Animated. And you click on uh, the American Revolution and you can watch some animated uh, movements of troops that will illustrate what's going on uh, in this chapter, primary focus being on the fighting that took place at uh, Trenton and Princeton. So jumping into Chapter 7. Uh, picking up where we left off at Chapter 6, Washington and the Patriots had had to evacuate New York City. You actually have Washington uh, crying and weeping because of the desperation that they were in and Nathaniel Green being totally perplexed. So it picks up with that, uh, with the American Army retreating all the way through uh, New Jersey. A uh, key guy to keep in mind here as we go through uh, this last chapter, Charles Lee, second in command to Washington, uh, continuing to be very, very critical of George Washington, had what folks thought was about an army of 4,000. Washington kept on sending messages and letters to, uh, to Lee uh, telling him, you need to join my army and Lee uh, never really does that. Uh, mentioning uh, in this chapter of a, another little pamphlet that was written by Thomas Paine called The Crisis, uh, calling for the Patriot soldiers to continue to fight. Uh, that's mentioned in here. Um, and you have, again, how uh, the British commander wanting to uh, to clear out territory, Henry Clinton, the second in command on the British side, uh, trying to press him to destroy uh, Washington's army. Uh, Charles Lee still not joining um, Washington at all. Uh, and Washington's um, adjutant general, uh, who helped him with um, uh, paperwork, helped him uh, issue orders, strategy, things of that nature. Uh, a man by the name of Thomas Reed, uh, kind of uh, losing confidence in George Washington, wrote uh, Charles Lee uh, a letter suggesting that Washington was done, uh, that he didn't need to be commander anymore, and that, in fact, Charles Lee uh, needed to be the commander. Uh, letters are sent back and forth between um, Reed and Lee, and Washington mistakenly ended up with one of these letters. It was given to him as if the letter was addressed to him, and in fact, it was a letter uh, that Lee had written uh, to Reed. Washington read it and realized uh, that um, it wasn't addressed to him, but he didn't realize that until after he had read it and knew that Reed uh, had been very critical of him. Washington, uh, with great uh, humility, uh, doesn't scold Reed. He simply, simply hands him the letter and says, look, this was addressed to you. Uh, here it is. Uh, and Reed was kind of embarrassed and would eventually, of course, regain his confidence uh, in George Washington. Um, so still no signs of Lee. Still hadn't joined up with Washington's army. That's where part one comes to an end of chapter seven. Uh, in part two, again, you have the American army uh, that is uh, retreating. Uh, General Howe uh, tries to issue an appeal to the Americans to stop fighting. A lot of loyalists uh, did so, rallied to the British Army, thinking that the Patriots uh, were still done. Washington makes the decision to retreat um, across uh, the Delaware River into Pennsylvania. So he's just uh, fleeing from the British Army. Uh, Washington, when he crossed the Delaware, destroyed boats so that the British uh, couldn't easily cross the Delaware River. Uh, and Lee, as I mentioned to you, still not linking back up with George Washington. But a fateful evening, December the 13th, uh, 1776, Charles Lee separated himself uh, 
uh, from his American troops that he was in command of and stayed at a local tavern uh, to get some uh, good food, a warm bed, etc. Uh, very kind of cocky, fairly foolish to do this as he isolated himself from his uh, army and the British captured him. A, a contingent commanded by a Lord Tarleton captured Charles Lee. The British rejoiced because they thought that Charles Lee uh, was a pretty well-trained uh, general. And McCullough uh, makes a pretty big deal of that and suggested that without this capturing of this American leader, Charles Lee, uh, that the move may have been made for Lee to actually to replace Washington and McCullough, the author of the book, of course, argues that it was good, uh, ultimately, that Lee got captured because it left uh, Washington in charge. Uh, Congress had to move out of Philadelphia because the British have moved into that, so things aren't looking good. Eventually, what was Lee's army did join up with Washington, but it was more like 2,000 troops as opposed to 4,000. But at this point, Washington... As he is stationed at Trenton, the British think he's going to hunker down, excuse me, as he uh, crosses the uh, Delaware opposite Trenton, New Jersey, the British thinks that he's going to hunker down uh, for the winter. He's got good generals. Uh, he's got his army, although only 7,000 men strong. He still has an army. And he's got Henry Knox, who has become quite uh, capable of using artillery. Uh, at this point, uh, Reed and other advisors to Washington uh, begin to suggest that, hey, we need to try something. We need to take a bold and daring action. And Washington, uh, in fact, decides to do that. And the plan uh, that he developed was in a bold move on Christmas Eve to recross the Delaware River and to launch a surprise attack on Hessian troops that were stationed at Trenton. So that plan had been made. And part three, the last section of the last chapter of the book, uh, deals with uh, the crossing, so to speak, uh, as the Americans will cross the Delaware River extremely cold. Uh, they fell behind schedule. You have a couple men that actually freeze because of the elements. The Hessian commander at Trenton, a guy by the name of Johann Rawl, had received a couple of warnings. Look, you need to be aware. Washington may attack. He may try something. Actually, suggestions that there were American troop movements. Uh, Rawl, the Hessian commander, kind of ignored those. Uh, distinct possibility that he was actually even handed a note uh, with this warning, refused to read it, stuck it uh, in his uh, coat pocket, uh, and and wouldn't uh, wouldn't even read it. So the Americans catch the British totally off guard at Trenton. Uh, the fighting only uh, lasts about 45 minutes. Uh, you have a number of British soldiers that are killed. About a hundred are captured, uh, and Rawl has to surrender. He's mortally wounded. He will eventually. Uh, obviously die as a result of that. So that's the big victory at Trenton for George Washington. Cornwallis, another British commander, is sent in, oh, I can't remember with how many troops, I think about 8,000 troops uh, to Princeton, uh, just north, uh, northeast of, uh, of Trenton, New Jersey, and he begins, Cornwallis begins to make plans to swoop down on Washington at Trenton. Uh, but Washington will trick him. He keeps some fires burning and leaves just a skeleton force at Princeton. And as Cornwallis moves, thinking that he's going to capture Washington uh, at Trenton, Washington, in fact, takes his army and moves north and east and captures Princeton and captures another small uh, British Army at that point. So these are really the first significant American victories. Uh, small battles, though. This is not a major army uh, at all that has been defeated. So when you come to the end of this book, uh, George III uh, has to tell Parliament and the British people about these setbacks. Uh, but what you're looking at, as we'll pick up later in the course of the year as the American Revolution continues, the fighting at Trenton and Princeton uh, 
uh, forced the British to a very bold plan to try to deliver a knockout blow to the Americans, and that'll be the Battle of Saratoga uh, that we'll deal with. It's out of the uh, scope of, of this book that you're looking at. Uh, so with uh, the new year, uh, you have the Americans having won these little victories, and McCullough ends the book uh, just kind of by giving an overview of his final thoughts on Washington and the war itself. Uh, in regard to Washington, McCullough, in summary, would just have us remember, yes, he was a man of flaws, a man who made some poor decisions, particularly in the New York campaign, uh, but he was the man for the job. McCullough ultimately concludes that the U.S. does not win the American Revolution without uh, George Washington uh, being the overall commander. And McCullough ends the book by just reminding us of the, uh, the bloodshed of the American Revolution. Uh, 25,000 Americans are going to die in the American Revolution. That represented about 1% of the total population. Uh, not significant numbers when you compare it to World War II or World War I even, but in terms of percentage of the population, second only to the American Revolution. Uh, so that gives you an overview of, uh, of Chapter 7, and that concludes our look at 1776. So use these at your own desire as you prepare for your summer reading test. Thanks a lot. Hope it helps.